Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio, back with a good friend, Mike Cernovich, a lawyer, a documentary filmmaker, and the best-selling author of Guerrilla Mindset, How to Control Your Thoughts and Emotions to Live Life on Your Terms, and MAGA Mindset, How to Make You and America Great Again. He is also the producer of the film documentary Silenced, A War on Speech. Please, please do yourself a solid and follow Mike on Twitter at twitter.com slash Cernovich, C-E-R-N-O-V-I-C-H. And go to his uh, website, soon to be redesigned, I hear, dangerandplay.com. Mike, uh, thanks so much for taking the time today. Yeah, it's been too long. A lot of people said, you guys got to do more episodes together. And I told them that, unlike the left, we don't have these secret meetings where we coordinate coverage <laughs> or anything. And, and maybe that's to our, our detriment in a way, but there is no grand conspiracy of us. Right. So we'll be talking about the Gulag Archipelago, and this is a book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which is the history of concentration camps in the Soviet Union. And to me, Mike, the world is divided into two people, at least in the West. The world is divided into those who have a freaking clue about the history of socialism and communism and the people who don't. And uh, the people who don't, to me, are dangerous idiots to be used for the expansion of state power at the expense of liberty and free speech and, and all kinds of freedoms. And it's an exhausting, the book, it's an exhaustive and compelling account of his near decade in Soviet prison camps. And he was not allowed to be a historian, right? He couldn't, he wasn't allowed pen and paper or pencil and paper throughout his entire incarceration. Uh, he had to rely on a little over 200. He's got an amazing photographic memory, a little over 200 of his inmates, contemporary um, stories and histories and, and accounts of what happened. And his estimate is that um, close to 60 million people were slaughtered in the Soviet Union by communism. And that's one country out of many. Yes, the communism, of course, is a an expansionist ideology. It's a world ideology. National socialism or Nazism was a nationalist ideology and had no aims to conquer the world. Uh, but uh, communism is different. It is a virus that seeks to invade everyone and everything and take over everything. And it is far from dead. So what was your history of uh, reading the book and what did you get out of it? Well, it's weird because I read A Day in the Life of Ivan Desenovich in high school. I think it's Ivan Desenovich. Uh, Denisovich, I think. Denisovich, yeah, there you go. Cernovich, I can't. I should be able to pronounce his <laughs> name. So I can name like Cernovich. And I read that way back in high school, which God bless my English teacher for assigning that kind of reading. So I had a little bit of a background on how the hopelessness of the gulags were and how miserable everything was, the constant starvation of people falling off. And then I read about the Cambodian genocide when I was touring um, Vietnam and Thailand and Cambodia. I read Survival in the Killing Fields and about the left-wing orthodoxy and how collectivism leads you to the murder camps. That is why actually it, people who followed me, followed my trajectory for years, but noticed that I was actually never politically involved before and I thought it was a waste of time and that all you should really care about is just figure out a way to make money, get your mindset right, go to the gym, who cares, right? And then when I read Survival in the Killing Fields, the story began with a family, a father and a mother and two children. They drove their car over a bridge into the water to commit suicide because he had an understanding of what was going to happen with the Cambodian genocide after the, the left wing, of course, people, the communists had taken over in Cambodia. So I know, then I realized, okay, I see the parallels happening here in America with these left-wing identity politics. So then, of course, I pick up the this book, which is all the rage now, and I hope everybody reads it or gets the audiobook and listen to it. And then it, I didn't realize how bad it was and how long the purges had happened, where I had known that they went after people who weren't communists. I had kind of a sense of it, but I didn't realize they went after kulaks, who were peasant farmers, because they thought the peasant farmers were making a profit, and therefore they should be killed. They should be rounded up. Um, Kill it, you know. Kill the Ukrainians and the the Holodomor. Yeah, and 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 that's uh, that six million right there. Just in the uh, you, 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 Ukraine has some of the best soil in Europe. It's called the breadbasket of Europe. And they went in and uh, took over everyone's farms and and stole everyone's land, and then made these ridiculous no profit situations where people had to basically eat their own uh, savings and eat their own food and and never produce enough for everyone else. Resulting a few years later in the deaths, uh, the starvation deaths, which is a brutal and ugly death uh, of six million people. 
Right. So we had at least six million killed in the Ukrainians. The peasant farmers all throughout Russia were hunted down and killed. And then after they they decided that wasn't enough, and then they had to kill everybody who wasn't part of the revolution. Who was? I mean, what was interesting is that Solzhenitsyn was actually part of the military. He was part of their end group at one time. He was a Russian soldier, and he may have, or um, he may have had some part in some bad things that had happened under the Russian army name. And that was another aspect of the story I didn't realize is how many people who were regular Russian army ended up in the camps, in the gulags. The, well, in you particular, know, the, after the defeat um, that was inflicted by the Germans uh, on, on the uh, Russian front, uh, there were huge surrenders, like over 100,000 troops surrendered in one battle and, and 80,000 in another. So Stalin looked pretty bad. So one of the things he wanted to do was when he got these uh, soldiers back, he was concerned that uh, he was going to look like a bad military commander for losing these battles. Also, he was concerned that the Soviet troops had seen the wealth in the West, and we're going to come back and talk about it. So he basically called them all traitors and threw them all into these uh, concentration camps, where, by the way, the, the long hours, the inadequate food, the lack of medical care, the lack of sleep, about 10% of the population of these concentration camps died every single year. He called it um, dying while alive, is the phrase that Solzhenitsyn uh, used, and uh, it really was an unbelievably brutal situation, far worse than slavery. Uh, and yet, of course, we hear nothing about it. Yeah, far worse than slavery, far worse than other genocides that occurred. And of course, you know, it's interesting because this book contextualizes so many things. I had read about the rape of Berlin a couple of years ago in terms of what actually happened after World War II, how Stalin was a murderous, horrible person, and how American communists rehabilitated his brand. This is another thing a lot of people don't know is if you go back and read the New York Times in the 1940s and 50s, they were praising Stalin. Time Magazine had him on the cover, Man of the Year. He was called Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe Stalin, and they were covering up his war crimes. So right after, um, uh, right towards the end of the war, World War II, the Soviet Army came in, and it was called the Rape of, Ber Rape of Berlin, where every woman aged 8 to 80 was raped. They actually dragged out mattresses into the streets. That's how prevalent the rape was. You wouldn't even, it doesn't even sound real because it is so horrific, but they're detailed historical accounts. If you look at uh, suicide records and abortion records, something like 10% of women committed suicide after, after that had happened. So the rape of Berlin had happened. And there was a story in there where three uh, Russian soldiers were actually going to rape a girl who was a German girl, which would have been okay, but they ended up getting thrown into the gulags because one of the girls they were going to rape was the what they called the campaign wife of one of the secret police type of commanders. So you, you realize just how evil this empire had been at the time. And then you look at American news coverage, the contemporaneous coverage, we're, we're told that these are the good guys, right? So not only are we not being told accurate history today, but when you look at what the American media was saying about the communists at the time that all this was happening, they were covering it up. So fake news in America was a huge problem and actually led to more atrocities. And who, who was it? Um, there was a New York Times reporter who won a Pulitzer for his uh, coverage. Walter, Walter Durante is his name. Yes. Yeah, most people don't know this. A New York Times journalist, Walter Durante, was given a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of this. He claimed the Holodomor never happened, that they weren't being starved. There was just some uh, minor uh, food shortages, no big deal. Oh, it's, it's truly astonishing. And there is, of course, this leftist perspective that you hear. First of all, you won't hear about this stuff. The only uh, genocides are the ones committed by Western powers, right? The Nazis and so on. You won't hear anything about what happened uh, in, in the Soviet Union. And um, if you do hear about it, then what you'll hear is they'll say, well, you know, Stalin went kind of nuts. And, you know, it was really all about Stalinism and Stalinism isn't communism. First of all, fuck you for saying that, leftists. Because if you have a system where one 
crazy homicidal lunatic can take over and order the deaths of tens of millions of people. That's a shitty system. Sorry, I like, I, oh, that's just, well, you know, it was a great system till this one insane evil guy took it over and ordered the deaths of ten. That's not a good system. There's no checks and balances, no private property. And of course, they um, uh, didn't allow for private ownership of guns. Uh, first thing the left always does is try and get your guns away from you because then uh, they have you uh, at their mercy, uh, which tends to be non, non-existent. So the first thing they say, and then one, one of uh, Solzhenitsyn's big goals in this was to point out, no, 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 no. It wasn't Paradise Lost. It wasn't the Garden of Eden and then, you know, with Stalin as Eve. No, no, no. This started right at the beginning. And yes, the first order to set up concentration camps came in 1919 under Lenin. This was right from the beginning. And this is really, really important to understand. It is the system as a whole that centralizes power in the hands of the state. Uh, you have nothing left. You have no control. And power corrupts and power brutalizes. And Solzhenitsyn himself said, I was an asshole when I was in the army. I was like a horrible human being. Uh, I was callous and cold and, and lacked empathy. He said often in his life, I thank God for prison. Prison saved my soul. Right. And it wasn't. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. One is that, first of all, the left claims it never happened, didn't happen. Then when they lose that argument, they go, well, it was just Stalin was a crazy guy. Well, what about Mao? What about Pol Pot? What about Castro? What about Shea, right? Why is it that the hammer and sickle, the symbol of Stalinism and the symbol of death, is not viewed in America the same way as the swastika is? If you put us talk about semiotics and symbols and brands, if you put a swastika in your Twitter profile, it, people are going to think even ironically, what the hell's wrong with you, right? All these people, though, they put that hammer and sickle, which that, that's what this stands for. That is what this stands for. But you're not going to be fired from a job in a media company. You're not going to have your life ruined. The, the fake news in America is not going to write stories about you and say, how can you put your stamp of approval on and associate with people? They, in terms of evil, we have a problem talking about degrees of evil. But there's no question that Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao – were as evil as Hitler, and they actually killed an order of magnitude. Well, not Pol Pot, but collectively, Pol Pot only killed, you know, 25% of the Cambodian population. You know, because until the Vietnamese stopped him, Vietnam stopped him, because he wanted to invade invade Vietnam. That was the only thing that stopped him. Or half of the Cambodians may have been murdered. Mao, who knows how many he killed? Nobody knows for sure, but it's in the tens of millions. Stalin is in the tens of millions. So they're at an evil, a level of evil as great as Hitler, they actually killed more people, but you're never going to hear American media or Canadian media criticize them. That's weird. Why is that? Well, I mean, it's, um, it's worse. It's always worse than, than people think. And I <clears throat> was, um, yeah, I had a great English teacher too, handed me a copy of uh, Ivan Denisovich when I was in junior high. And I read that and then moved on to, to Solzhenitsyn's uh, books and read, read other books. And once you get that, once you see that, your relationship to your culture, particularly to academia and the media, fundamentally changes. It fundamentally changes. And my relationship to Western philosophers, particularly the French philosophers, so the cultural Marxists uh, and Jean-Paul Sartre, famous existentialist, uh, it described Solzhenitsyn as a dangerous element because it threatened the grip of uh, moral authority that the left had on power. And uh, the guy who ran the killing fields in, uh, in Cambodia was, had a PhD from the Sorbonne. Uh, he was thoroughly steeped in uh, Western uh, leftism. And so uh, once you understand that and you see, like I remember being on the debate club and seeing a guy walk in, he had a little button of Marx, uh, Karl Marx. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, I remember cornering this guy and saying, do you, do, you, do you know what this guy did? Do you know what this guy is responsible for? Credible estimates put the deaths of communism, well, who knows? But it's well, well north of 100 million and could be as north of 200 million, uh, whereas the entire Second World War, including combatants, uh, was, uh, was 40 million only. And here's the thing, in war, at least you get a chance to fight back. Uh, under communism, they come in the middle of the night, they demand that they, they, they drag you out. They, they searched, the guy, guy had an, his infant baby who died from starvation, they dumped the body out and searched through the coffin of his baby to find incriminating evidence. The, 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 there were 31 torture mechanisms that they could use, uh, which were unbelievably brutal. Women who were arrested, uh, women in these concentration camps, were regularly raped. They took criminals 
criminals and put them in charge of concentration camps. Because if you were an ideological criminal, you were an enemy of the state. In other words, if you disagreed or questioned anything about communism, you were an enemy of the state. But if you were just a regular old rape and murder criminal, well, you were a victim of capitalism and, and profit, and therefore you were totally fine. And, and they, you don't have a chance to fight back with the left. They want to disarm you, and they want to put you in a category which is the opposite of human, the opposite of moral, wherein everything they do to you is justified because of the innate evil of your category. It's unbelievably dangerous and speaks back to that point of identity politics that you're talking about, that if you're in a particular category, white male or whatever it is, a capitalist, a profit seeker or whatever, you're portrayed as so evil that every injustice and evil that is done to you can be twisted into a form of self-defense. Yeah, it is um, appalling, and that's why people thought that I was joking when I go, this is a life or death election with Trump for me, because I was going to leave America, and people said, oh, you're just being a troll. And the next thing you know, people are being hit, women are being pepper sprayed merely because they want to watch a college talk. One of the persons pepper sprayed wasn't even a Trump person, said, make Bitcoin great again. It was just a hat spoofing, make America great again. She was pepper sprayed. That's why when I tell people this is life or death, the left is feral, the left is violent. If we didn't have guns and Hillary Clinton had been in office, we would be on our way to death camps. There's no question about that. And people go, well, I don't believe that. That sounds crazy. Okay, well, let's, let's reason it through. If you're in Germany and Angela Merkel is a hero of the American media, remember they, they're trying to say the, the only survivor and whatever of the West, the bastion of the West is Angela Merkel versus Donald Trump is some primitive guy. If you're in Germany and you question official narratives, you can be arrested and enslaved by the state. So tell me how that is any different than Stalin's gulag. Thought the only crimes. difference is hate speech are intellectually uh, category evil thought crimes. Exactly. And the only difference between what is happening in Germany today and what happened in Stalin's time is the scale is much smaller. People in Germany are so afraid that they know better than to speak out. But if you can be arrested for merely questioning official narratives, if you can be arrested for having wrong think, bad thoughts, for saying the wrong thing, how, tell me how that is any different than putting people into re-education camps. There's no difference. Well, that is what people want here in America. They want hate speech to be not protected. They want to say, can you punch a Nazi? And moreover, everybody that we don't agree with is a Nazi, and therefore they can be the victim of physical violence. We see that every day. Now in America, the parallels are ominous. There's no question that if the left took power and were able to disarm Americans, then we would have death camps in America. Well, I think this is um, something that, that people need to, to remember and, and understand the, how much infiltration has occurred from socialist communists into particularly the uh, educational system and particularly, of course, universities. I remember um, knowing the history of um, USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, socialist, 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 right? And this is why they have to use Nazi rather than national socialist, because they don't want to harm the brand of socialism. So when you have someone like Bernie Sanders running, socialist, the same, like it, it is the equivalent of somebody from the Nazi party running. And people don't understand this. They also don't understand the suffering that these kinds of policies have put in place, even closer to home, more recently in places like Venezuela, where people are dying of starvation and people are dying of lack of health care. And the government is actually coming in with guns to take over bakeries because uh, apparently having guns pointed at you doesn't make you a whole lot more productive as a baker and they're running out of food. And I remember when I first was in university and I I took a course uh, called The Rise of Capitalism and the Socialist Response because I was more interested. And I, if I remember right, I teach the professor, an out-and-out -out communist. And I just remember thinking, how is this possible? How is it possible for a communist to be teaching? And again, it's nothing to do with, yeah, go speak all you want, go, you know, but, but given that it's much more feral, feral and vicious and destructive and has a much higher body count even than Nazism, how is this possible? And again, once you get this and, and you read about these things, it's really hard to have the same relationship with your culture or respect for the intellectuals within your culture ever again. In the media, there was another great book that I started to read about an American baseball team and they were communist idealists and they went 
to move the forgotten i think it's called either either the forgotten or forsaken it's a great book i haven't finished it i need to finish it it was an american baseball team because americans were leaving america and that's why they ended up in the gulags americans were leaving america because they were communists and they were being told by the american media including walter duranty at the new york times that, that the russia soviet union is great go over there they would go over there their passports would be taken once they enter the country, and they would often enter um, in the gulags and the death camps too. That is another reason why I have no respect for American media. And when I say that I'm it's my adversary and that I want to see it fall and fail, that is why. Because they want us to live the way they're living in Venezuela, the way they were living in Castro's Cuba, the way they were living in the Soviet Union. They don't support freedom. They, they don't support prosperity. They want to centralize control of information. I mean, we can even see it now. I mean, it's beautiful when you have proper worldviews, a proper philosoph philosophical view. And this is why you don't teach kids philosophy. You don't want to think. Right now, the media wants to centralize news and information. People like you, people like me, people like Paul Joseph Watson, people maybe who say things that are a little bit off the wall, other people I won't name. Who cares? Why can't everybody speak? But now they want to keep get them websites banned from Facebook, banned from Twitter, banned from YouTube, because anybody who isn't part of that central collectivized narrative is an enemy. So you think about it, government ownership of capital, centralized ownership of capital, you understand then that the real category between right and left is centralized power and control versus localized power and control. And the question I posed you uh, that I don't even know the answer to couple months ago, I think, when we were doing podcasts, is why is it that the left are so prone to violence versus the right? And I was kind of thinking of a Confucianist expression, which is the long, the long stock gets the, the lawnmower or whatever. That's not... I, I oh, just the tall it. poppy gets uh, cut down, or it's the, it's the nail right. that sticks up that gets hammered down. Right, right, exactly. The, the, that's the leftist mindset, the collectivist mindset, which is if you stand out, if you're exceptional then you're immediately going to be singled out for attack. That's what happened with the kulaks. I mean, if you think about it, when the communists originally went after kulaks, they were peasant farmers. You and me and the people watching us, even maybe people who don't have jobs, would say, wow, I might be unemployed, but these kulaks, they had it rough. The life of a peasant farmer was unforgiving, long days, hot weather. They were viewed as having too much. They were viewed as being exceptional. They were being viewed as a poppy that had to be cut down. That is the leftist mindset in action is wherever you excel, wherever you're doing better than everyone else, they don't want to raise everybody else up. They want to cut you down to the level of everyone else. Right. There is on the left an inability to distinguish between high quality, medium quality and low quality. And because, and this is part of the Dunning-Kruger effect, like if you're not particularly good at something, it just looks easy. But there is a sort of mathematical equation that the left doesn't understand, that in general, half your productivity comes from, from the square root of your workers, right? And you can look at, there's a great Jordan Peterson lecture on this. But if you have 10 workers, three of them are going to produce half of your output. If you have uh, 10,000 workers, 100 of them are going to produce half of your output. There is a bell curve in terms of uh, intelligence and, and, and uh, ambition and efficiency, maybe even of testosterone and dedication and so on. And so a small number of people produce an enormous amount of value within society. And, and you can just sort of look back, you know, think of the painters of the 19th century. There were millions and millions and millions of people painting, we remember maybe 10 or 20. So entire fields, entire industries, uh, and all of society is like this giant inverted pyramid on the competence and intelligence and dedication of a very, very few people. So the fact that um, the sort of inverted pyramid of, of how much uh, rests on these people, the fact that they end up with a lot of money makes perfect sense. So the people who were the, the, the peasant farmers, if you were better at being a peasant farmer, then you would make more money, which would allow you to buy more land, which would allow you to be more productive. And everyone benefited except the person in the short run you were buying their land from, right? Maybe they didn't do that well. And so because there's this lack of understanding 
of how productive the mi tiny minority is in society, how much of society's wealth depends upon the productivity of a tiny, tiny number of people. They look at wealthy people, they look at people who are very successful, and all they feel is this Nietzschean resentment and this rage and this feeling of having been stolen from. And there are sophists who go in there and like Iago, drip the poison of socialism into these people's ears and say, hey, the only reason that guy's got a big house is because you're living in a shack, is because you don't have enough. They don't say, the, the reason why you have bread is because that guy has a big house. The reason why you have a job is because that guy's a millionaire or a multimillionaire. They don't explain to people how productivity works and how rare it is and how concentrated it is among a tiny minority in the population. And therefore, they rouse all of this resentment and they say, we're going to go take back what was stolen from us. And they get everyone with pitchforks and they go up and they stab the guy to death and they take his stuff or they throw him in jail or they berate him on, on Twitter or whatever. And then what happens is, as we saw, when they took all the land from the most productive people, um, within half a decade, 15 million people had starved to death because the wages of sin is death and envy and violence is a sin. Well, and you had done some of the only real analysis and journalism anybody in the West can find on South Africa, where you did the podcast explaining how the quotas meant that they had to fight. The quotas meant that if you were an engineering department, the number of engineers had to be proportionate to the different populations. So they fired all of the engineers who actually made things happen. And now the whole country is having rolling blackouts. The farms were taken and confiscated from people in, oh, the country escapes me right now, maybe Nigeria. But all of the white farmers were driven out of their land. And now the president of that country is saying, we, we want the white farmers we want the white farmers to come back. We want the productive people to come back. So there's something about that resentment that people have, the lack of gratitude, not realizing that we are lucky to have highly successful, highly productive people. We're going to live in a world where we're going to get abundant benefits from a few number of people, and we should embrace that. But it's an easier sell to be, go, well, hey, your life didn't end up the way you thought it would be, which is what we have now, of course, in America, too, and why you can see all these parallels. Every day you're telling people you should have way more than you have now. The reason you don't have it is because of this group. And in America, we switched from economics, management versus labor, capital versus labor, to gender and race. So now it is the only reason you don't have anything is because of these evil straight white men. So that evil straight white men must be hunted down, must be attacked, must be fired from their jobs, must be punched in the face, because obviously if you're a straight white man, you're a Nazi, you see it all happening here. And it can be a little bit frustrating. Who, who was the, um, the Greek curse, I think, Cassandra, where you're able to see the future, but nobody would actually believe you, right? Mm. You're thinking, you were, this is happening here. This is getting, things are getting bad in America. You can't wear a Donald Trump hat down the street without being punched in the face. People might, there'll, there'll be a death eventually. Eventually there'll be uh, murders from the left, killing people. You can't even do that in America. This is supposed to be the land of the free. We have free speech. What is going on? Well, I mean, you, you plan a party. And you've got a bunch of lunatics uh, threatening acid attacks and, and other things. Who, by the way... I mean, let's just stop on this for a moment because I still have, sadly, the capacity to be shocked by this stuff, Mike. So the people who planned the attack on the deplorable, what the fuck? Community service? Erasure well, yeah. of, of the record of this criminal attack? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still appalled and shocked. Uh, can you just step people through this? I want, I want this to, to remain in people's heads as part of this whole conversation. Well, see, I am so cynical now that I was just even impressed that they were arrested, right? I'm, I was shocked that they were even arrested. So for those who don't know, I co-hosted an event in DC called The Deplorable. It was prim and proper kind of event. It took six figures to plan. You know, it was a real financial risk and everything and was never even made to make a profit. We just wanted to break even during inauguration week. So a number of people, three or four people, were caught on video by James O'Keefe from Project Veritas planning an acid attack on the party. By that, they were going to put acid in the ventilation system. And this acid can cause a lot of allergic reactions to people, wheezing. They were going to be pregnant women, of course, attending the event. Well, they I'm sorry to interrupt as well, but they knew what was going into the vents. 
your uh, the party members wouldn't have. I mean, they don't know if it's something that is really uh, they could stampede to the exit. People in high heels, people can get. I mean, a Who concert causes you know stampedes at a Who Who concert can get people killed. So uh, the, it is a very dangerous thing to do. I just wanted to mention that. Well, they would have been, they were going to set off the sprinklers too. So the idea was they were going to set off the sprinklers. They were going to put acid through the ventilation system where people wouldn't know it was going to happen. There are two doors out of the venue, and now you're going to have over a thousand people going through two small doors. We've all watched those videos of soccer events where people get pushed and smashed and killed. So it was an act of domestic terrorism was planned. They were arrested and charged with misdemeanor assault. They were given, which this is how jaded I am. This is how jaded I am about America and cynical I am. I was thinking, wow, they were arrested, right? I used to be, you know, five years ago, I'd be like, I can't believe it was only a misdemeanor. This is unbelievable. I'm thinking, wow, they were actually arrested. I can't even believe that they would arrest somebody like that in D.C. They were arrested. They took a plea deal, which was they would get what's called the deferred adjudication. So they said, if you go do 48 hours of community service and you don't do anything bad for six months, then your record will be cleaned, wiped clean, as if it never happened. That's America. You're going to plan an acid attack. There definitely would have been serious injuries, and potentially there would have been deaths due to the stampede effect. But that's the thing. The acid in the ventilation system would ruin the event, would make it kind of a disaster. But the, the real danger was all these people trying to get through these narrow openings, and again, including women who are pregnant were attending the event. 48 hours of community service. Thank you, Washington, D.C. This is what the government does, but this is a pattern. They are stand-down orders. There were Trump supporters attacked at Trump rallies in San Jose. A stand-down order had been issued. People are being attacked. In Berkeley, there had been a stand-down order. So what is happening now is that the left, they cannot put us in death camps yet. Here's what they can do. Oh, you want to have a rally? Oh, Antifa wants to be terrorize you? Terrorists want to come over there and they want to attack you? Oh, well, we'll just tell the police not to do anything. But what we're seeing now arise, which again is, uh, this is dangerous for society, is of course the, the base stick man arises, right? So we now have right wing people going to these events with you know, baseball helmets on and 3M masks so that they can't be pepper sprayed, goggles and stuff. And you're having some kind of open skirmishes with Antifa because we're, as we live in a lawless world now. The left will not protect us. They will not use the police department to protect people as they should. Now we're going to have to have people on the right form their own private protection squads, which is going to escalate the violence. And as you and I both know, violence never ends well. We want to try to wait. We want to try to prevent all this from happening. But again, this is all, this is all the same here. Just because we're not in death camps doesn't mean that the state isn't trying to kill us. The state is trying to kill us because by refusing to prosecute those domestic terrorists who are going to attack the deplorable the way they should, they're sending a wink, wink, nod, nod. Hey, you know, if you guys want to go after these people, if you want to kill them, you want to hit them with a the baseball bat, eh, maybe we won't even arrest you. If we do, you're going to get a slap on the wrist. That is the government getting private people to do the kind of work that Stalin would have done under his own government. Well, and compared that to the multiple felonies that uh, Bay Stickman was uh, charged with, uh, and um, it's uh, it's a different world for the right and the left. And you know, people don't who not. I shouldn't say on the right, but people who don't conform to the leftist narrative, whatever they end up being politically. If you're not in that category of non-leftists, you don't have a clue what it's like out there being a public figure. Hey, feel like going to do a speech? Feel like going to do a a, a, a a book tour? Hey, do you feel like doing a college speaking tour? Do you feel like just throwing a party? Well, it's kind of open season on you and very few, if any, repercussions are going to um, be leveled against the people uh, who physically assault you or, or your followers. I mean, you know, Charles Murray out there trying to give a speech. They end up putting this female professor in a neck brace uh, with attacks, uh, attacking his car and so on. Uh, it is a, it is a, a sort of um, Hobbesian jungle out there for people not part of the leftist narrative. And if you're on the left... And you're part of it. Well, you're an asshole, and you're you're as guilty uh, as in in morally, at least in my mind, as the people swinging the the axe handles of people. And you don't understand what it's like if you're not part of the leftist narrative. What it's like to be a public facing uh, figure, uh, knowing that you uh, you can take your life in your hands going out there and speaking uh, basic data.
Yeah, if, even if I try to hold a guerrilla mindset seminar, I have to tell the venue in advance, hey, you're probably going to get a bomb threat call then. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? So even I, I can't hold the big kind of seminars that I should be able to hold because I can't get a venue for 5,000 people. Because if I got a venue for 5,000 people and I laid down the kind of cash it would take to have a kind of venue there, the left, they're going to call in bomb threats. They're going to pull the fire alarms. That's if we're lucky. If we're lucky, all they do is pull a fire alarm. If they really want to go at it, they'll put acid in your ventilation system. They'll hit you. They will pepper spray you. They'll attack you. And I don't see any kind of concern about that from the left. Here's what I hear from the left, and this is one thing that's always bothered me, right? I'm not all right. But what I always ask people is, show me people on the alt-right who are pepper spraying people. Oh, these alt-right Nazis are such bad people. They're evil people. They're terrible people. we got to do something about it. I hear that every day. Okay, great. Show me these alt-right people who are out pepper spraying women, who are hitting women, attacking women, fighting people, planning domestic terrorist attacks. They can't do it. So that, again, tells you that the left is completely morally depraved. I would have no problem. That's the whole thing. If, if people think you should be polite on Twitter, you shouldn't troll people, I would have some respect for that if that view were held uniformly to everybody. But the, as we've learned now with the left, there is no – they're morally bankrupt. They, there is no moral uniformity. They're not saying, well, wait a minute. These people on the left are really acting up. Maybe we should worry a little bit less about mean tweets on Twitter and more about the violent acts of the Antifa. You don't hear that at all, and it could be because of a defective brain. I don't know. It could be just pure evil, but at this point, I don't really care. The way I look at it at this point is it's a matter of survival now, and they are a warring army who want to kill us all. Well, and I'd plumbing into the motivations of a feral enemy can be debilitating for one's resolution for, for self-protection. So two points I wanted to make as well, because, uh, and I really, really, it's an 1800-page book. Uh, and I mean, what, what Solzhenitsyn went through to write it should never be underestimated. What an incredible risk he took. You know, he worked on this book at friends' places. There was a, a musician who was quite popular with the regime. He would go over to his place and work on it because the musician was less likely to be raided. The man had to bury the manuscript in his, uh, in his garden or in the woods every single night for fear that he was going to be caught and put back uh, in, into the gulags. Uh, the only way he ended up getting out of the gulags was he lied and said that he was actually a nuclear physicist. So he was transferred to a scientific gulag where he pretended to be a scientist for some time. Uh, he was an astonishingly brave man and had cancer uh, throughout some of this period as well. So he was like the, the amount of courage and, and integrity, not just him, but everyone who protected him, everyone who helped circulate uh, all of this stuff. Uh, it's truly remarkable and you need to read it. It's brutal and grim reading, but you know, we, we, uh, we look at sick people so we avoid the habits that end up with us uh, on the deathbed. Where they came from in Russia was vastly different, and, and Solzhenitsyn bitterly points this out repeatedly in the book, and rightly so. So here's, here's a quote uh, from the book. Uh, and he was comparing the uh, trials and the mock trials, the show trials, and basically they would arrest you, and he's got a whole list of all the horrible things that they would do to you, all, all of the tortures, all of the um, – it's the same thing that happens sometimes in the Western justice departments where they say, well, you know, you can go to trial uh, and we'll, you'll get 10 years, or you can cop a plea deal and get a year or two years. And people just confess because – not because of any system of justice, but out of fear and of the negatives, and uh, they would do this. They would, they would tell your wife to come down to the uh, – um, police station uh, for some innocuous reason. And they would have a walk by and they'd say, you have to have your head lowered, you can't look up. And they would have her walk by uh, and they say, if you raise your head, we're going to keep you here indefinitely. She'd walk by and at the same time, your interrogators would say, oh, look, we've just arrested your wife. And if you don't confess, we're going to keep her here too. Or, or they would say, we're going to arrest your daughter and throw her into a jail full, full of uh, syphilitic men. She's going to get raped, she's going to get syphilis and die a horrible, lengthy death. And so this was the sort of pseudo justice system they'd openly tell you listen we're going to find you guilty no matter what so you can either confess and get half your sentence or you can fight us and we'll send you to the very worst camp in the most remote area uh, and it's going to be a death sentence nobody comes back from there alive and so people would sign these these confessions of course had nothing to do with justice so he comparing he was comparing this to what happened under the czar so here's a quote he said who in our fatherland except some bookworms remembers now that katakozov who fired at the czar was provided with a defense lawyer 
Can you imagine? The guy who shot directly at the czar was given a full defense lawyer and a public trial. He says, or that Zhelyabov and all of the Nadonanya Volga gang were tried in public, or that Vera Zasulich, who attempted to kill the official who was, translated into Soviet terms, the chief of the Moscow administration of the MVD, although she missed and the bullet went past his head, not only was not destroyed in a torture chamber, but was acquitted in open court by the jury, no troika, and then went off in triumph in a carriage. So this was happening before communism. There was a trial by jury. There were defense lawyers. There was a legal system that had very positive common law elements and wasn't perfect, of course, but compared to what came afterwards, what path Russia could have gone on if it hadn't been for these monstrous sociopath communists uh, taking over and and destroying the the country and destroying tens of millions of people, it's a heartbreaking thing to think about what could have been. And and this was happening here, it's what's happening in the West, it's what's happening in America slowly but surely. There was another great, great quote that I don't have it pulled which is about resistance. And the quote goes something like, what would have happened if when they, the secret police were making those night raids, if they never knew when a group of people were going to go after them, shoot them, ha- attack them, hit them with the ball bat? It would have completely changed. And that was another, it's always fascinating to think about this book. Why didn't people fight back? And it's easy for us to say, right? Why didn't they fight back? But now we're watching our own freedoms being eroded. And he says openly, but there was one one town where a quarter of the citizens were arrested in one night. Right. And they would order you to tiptoe down the stairs so as not to wake your neighbors. And they would, of course, come in the middle of the night because they got the the, uh, arresting officers got bonus pay for night work. And also because you'd be dazed and delirious. And also you wouldn't sleep as a whole because you'd be fearful uh, of this. And there was a woman whose her husband was an engineer. He was arrested and and killed, uh, murdered in, in the torture interrogation. And she was sleepless for months until the Germans invaded and then she could get asleep. Uh, and then the, the allegiance that they had towards the invading German army, some of the people who were horrified by all of this um, was, was not to be underestimated. And Solzhenitsyn said, well, why didn't we fight back? Why didn't we push back? We didn't love freedom enough. We didn't love freedom enough. And also that old song, right? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. There will come a tipping point in the West as as laws against free speech escalate, as the permission implicitly granted to the feral left by the powers that be to attack the enemies of socialist structures in the state, the deep state. There will come a time where it's too late. uh, And then I think we'll all look back and say, why the hell didn't I do more? Right. And that is why I think it was so significant what what happened with the base stickman is in it. So I'm sure most of your viewers know about that. But a guy, there was a going to be a march for Trump in Berkeley. Antifa were there. Antifa is violent. So a few guys put on Nike baseball helmets and they went out there and they kind of fought in open field. And that is so significant because that is what we're going to have to do. The way I always tell my liberal friends, here's what I tell my liberal friends. I go, you don't realize it, but you're not the good guys. You're the violent ones. You're the ones out there harassing Trump supporters, beating up people, pepper spraying people. I said, it'll be over in 12 hours. If my team, my guys, if we want to make something happen, 12 hours, you guys are going to be crushed. And they go, well, why haven't you done that? And I said, because I know that once you have an army, the nature of armies is to fight wars. So it isn't if if we form our own army and we go and we crush the Antifa, the army doesn't say, oh, that was great. We, I'm glad we took them out of this band. The nature of an army is to say, well, where can we go next? That is just looking at, you know, as Marcus Aurelius would say, what is the nature of things? Or Aristotelian, what is the nature of things? The nature of an army is to fight and to conquer. So I want to be careful on that. But on the other hand, that is where we are heading. And what had happened in the gulags, very, not very unlikely, because anybody can be enslaved. It's less likely to happen here because there is this American ideal that we're not going to be bullied, we're not going to attack. And of course, that is why Soros and Hillary Clinton and the media want to do demographic replacement. They want to make it so that if you are a freedom-loving American, a real American, they want to import a bunch of fake Americans who want to give more power to the state, which is why if you look at voting patterns of all the immigrants who have been coming in since 1975, or 1965, they vote 70 80% liberal. So there, there are games going on 
to try to destroy freedom in America and to try to turn us into the hellhole that the Soviet Union was. Luckily, there's a lot of us speaking up. And again, it shows the power of free speech. You had no free speech in the Soviet Union. Right. Now, there's something else which, you know, the 20th century to me is incomprehensible without understanding the the um, genocidal tendencies of, of communism in particular and, and its lighter flavored uh, sort of uh, aspects, right? The, the the whole point of socialism is communism, according to Lenin, and I'll take him at his word. He seemed to know what the hell he was uh, doing. But it's really hard to understand the history of the 20th century without understanding the pivotal role that uh, communist aggression played throughout the world and the genuine terror that Western companies had of Soviet aggression. So uh, it is an aggressively atheistic philosophy. Uh, it, it has uh, as a significant enemy, um, Christianity in particular. And just as happened with the French Revolution, when they got into power, the feral leftists, they got into power and they started murdering priests and nuns uh, by the tens of thousands. Uh, the same thing happened, of course. Uh, Christians were killed by um, uh, atheistic uh, elements within communism. And this was completely terrifying. Germany was a very religious country, uh, has been in general the most religious country up until the late 20th century that existed uh, in Europe, uh, very Christian, uh, of course, the seat of of, uh, Protestantism and so on. And so when relatively close, there was this atheistic revolution that killed a huge number of of Christians, tens of millions of Christians. When the communists started targeting Germany, uh, the German population genuinely felt that they were in a fight for their lives. They felt, and and um, it's not hard, it's hard to argue against it, that they felt, look, whatever we have to do to keep the communists out, we're going to do. Because if they get in, we're dead. We're dead. And we're tortured and we're dead. And we're going to watch our children be raped and tortured and killed. And it is going to be a life uh, of of living hell uh, briefly and then uh, an endless demise. And without understanding how aggressive and how virulent communism communism was in its expansionistic phases, it's really hard to understand why, you know, these street fights, this destabilization of the economy and so on, why people might say, you know, that Hitler guy, kind of crazy. But, you know, if he can do something to keep us safe from certain death, I'll choose uh, even the totalitarianism of National Socialism over the near certain death of communist dictatorship. Yeah, I actually wrote a satirical article, which is how to create a fascist dictatorship. And I made a lot of those same points. I would say if I wanted to create a fascist dictatorship, I would tell the police to not protect Trump supporters. I would try to silence all free speech. And the punchline, of course, is that everything the left is doing would lead to a rise of fascism in America because fascism arises when the state will no longer protect the people. So then somebody who promises to protect the people says, I'll replace the state and then I'll be the chief protectant, which again is why political violence is such a fascinating, nuanced subject that most people in media are simply not intelligent or educated enough to have. On the one hand, it's great that we have these cultural icons like base stick man coming out and fighting Antifa. On the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, if that becomes widespread, that shows that the government who, if we're going to have a civilization, they are supposed to have a monopoly on force and a monopoly on law and order. And that is a power that people delegate in a civilized society, which you and I might not necessarily agree with that, but that's just kind of the way it is. If the government won't do the basic job of providing equal protection under the law, for people of all political views, then that is going to create a vacuum. And then you will have a fascist type figure arise in America. All the conditions are being made right for fascism, not by my side, not by the right, but by the left. And the only value that I think we can try and excavate from these tens of millions or maybe even hundreds of millions of bodies that uh, communism and, and extreme elements within socialist thought stand upon Mike is to me, it's a basic sociopath test. Uh, And this is a very strong way of putting it, but I I genuinely believe this to be the case. And it's been borne out in my life experience, which is not final proof, but it's something worth thinking about. So I couldn't help. And I remember sleepless nights uh, after I read this stuff, just haunted by the unbelievable amount of suffering and, and brutality and violence and torture and rape and viciousness. It is a Dantean circle of hell that seems to have no bottom when you get this kind of power and this kind of uh, destruction is unleashed within society. And it's a thin wall that holds it back. 
It's a thin wall that holds it back. The moment that there's that tipping point, it's amazing how quickly society can slide into um, unbelievably brutal totalitarianism. There's no inoculation that has protected every society throughout history. It all tends to be that way. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. So to me, it's a basic sociopath test that if you talk to someone about the gulag, uh, the gulags uh, and, and the documentation of how many people died, and if they start justifying it, or if they start defending it, or if they, well, it was just Stalin, or it's not real communism, and so on, to me, it's like, Bleh. no empathy. No empathy. Listen, tens or hundreds of millions of people were starved, beaten, raped, tortured, murdered in wars, murdered by the state, buried in graves. You know, when, when the Germans came in, they started digging in to, to bury their own dead, and they couldn't find places to put their own dead because there were so many mass graves in the cities and towns where they tried to to dig to bury their own dead. And so if someone immediately starts doing that lefty programming of minimization and focusing on Stalin or, you know, it wasn't real communism, let's just try it again. Holy crap, like tens or hundreds of millions of people were killed. If you're not fundamentally concerned with how that came about, if you're just glibly skating off that that those mass graves, there's something fundamentally and seriously wrong with your capacity for even basic humanity. Yeah, I don't think anybody would consider me a particularly emotional person, but when I read the book Survival in the Killing Fields, I was on a plane and I actually started crying. There were there was a scene in there, I'm not gonna tell what it was for anybody who wants to read the book, probably the most powerful book I ever read. And I, you start crying, you're weeping for the amount of suffering, especially the way it's described in these books. If you don't feel moved by that, you might as well not have be considered a human being. You have, you have no humanity. And it is an indication of the, the true evil that there is in the world. And what a lot of people are starting to realize is that a large percentage of sociopaths are in media because if you're a decent, honest person, working in the media world is terrible because you're around the most vile, disgusting people that you're ever going to encounter. In terms of journalists, they are bad. I would say nine out of 10 people who are at mainstream publications are legitimately bad people, legitimately dishonest, legitimately sociopathic. And if you're an honest person, a person of good moral character, you're going to enter into this profession and you have to choose to be around these people. And that's another reason our message doesn't get out as much as it could. It's very hard for people like us to want to be around and associate and work with those kinds of people. We have to fight back, though. And this, um, I think what you were talking about in terms of uncorking the uh, violent potential of um, the non-leftists is a great quote. It's a famous quote from the book, but I wanted to mention it here. Solzhenitsyn wrote, If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? And if the right gets tempted into violence, my concern is that, you know, the old thing, be careful that when you fight monsters, that you not become uh, a monster. I know you know you're Nietzsche based on your <laughs> the name of your blog. <laughs> But uh, it is, uh, you know, except in an extremity of self-defense, uh, I still think, and I'm still very dedicated uh, to, to the war of words. You know, we don't want to add that S to words to make them swords. The war of words is still where we can win this thing, because when you start uncorking legitimate, uh, legitimacy, even in self-defense uh, for political ideals, it is really hard, as you point out, to, to stop that ball, that, that snowball that turns into an avalanche once it gets started. Yeah, you tap into your own... All of us are ultimately, we all have a dark side. And it's better to live every day not in that dark side. But once you are, because I've known this, I've been in fights. You don't get into a fight and think, okay, I got in a fight, I beat the guy up. You feel that rush of adrenaline. That's what happens with people everywhere you go. And once you have that rush of adrenaline, that modifies your behavior, your preferences, and over time, your character. That's why... I'm re as much as I hate to use good guys and bad guys, I occasionally do. The left certainly are the bad guys. But if the right had to form an army to fight the left, you might start off as a good guys. But the way you're going to end is going to take you places that you never wanted to go, which is why, again, free speech is so important. If the left, though, keeps shutting down the right, they are going to they're going to face violence. But once 
Robespierre, right? The French Revolution. You're putting people in the guillotine one day, the next day your head's in the guillotine. It's better that we don't go down the path of violence and we continue arguing because that is what, here's what I always tell people. All I need is free speech. Don't play games with my Twitter profile. Don't shadow ban. Don't do anything because I believe the truth is on our side. And history shows us. History shows us that you would not have had the gulags had there been free speech. There, that was why they censored everybody. The minute word, that's why Solzhenitsyn had to, to bury his book. I think one point, didn't they say that you had to write part of the manuscript was transcribed in toilet paper or something like that? And it was passed around and other people would have to kind of transcribe it. Nobody knew because evil fears light, evil fears truth, evil fear, fears free speech. And that is why another kind of test that I have is your test of humanity is the gulags. And do people feel moved by that? One of my tests is censorship. If you want to censor people, that tells me that you're evil and you are avoiding exposure. You don't want anybody to know how evil you truly are. I think that's very well stated. Let me give you a, a brief thread about how dangerous free uh, suppression of free speech is. Not a lot of People know this, but in the First World War, um, Woodrow Wilson was like, no, no, we're not going to Europe. We're not going to get involved in their war. And then uh, in 1917, he committed to entering the war in Europe. And there was a lot of pushback against this. Um, hundreds of thousands of people refused to show up for the draft. Eugene Jeb Debs, back when the socialists uh, had at least some integrity in their anti-war stance, uh, Eugene Debs uh, ended up uh, spending 10 years uh, in prison. He was a socialist candidate uh, for politics uh, because he was arrested. There was a massive repression of free speech, and the American public was not allowed to make the case uh, against the war. Uh, it was sprung on the people and then... It was ruthlessly suppressed, any, any anti-war sentiment. So Woodrow Wilson got his war, and he went into uh, Europe with um, fresh troops and, and um, all of the productivity of the American capitalist system when it was turned to, to wartime production. So what happened was everybody was fighting themselves to exhaustion uh, in, in Europe. And, uh, you know, 10 million people had been killed, uh, you know, neighborhoods, countries, cities destroyed. And everybody was fighting themselves to exhaustion. And what would have happened if America hadn't joined the war is that uh, they would have just, everyone would have gone home. And when a war fails, it's good for the people, right? When a war fails, it's bad for the government, but it's good for the people because they don't want to go back into, into another war. And the ridiculous Treaty of Versailles would not have been able to be imposed on Germany. As, as America came in, the Allies had so much power, they were able to crush uh, Germany. Now, when the Allies came in, Germany said, well, we're screwed on the Allied front, so we've got to do something to take Russia out of the war. So they funded Lenin, and they sent him in through Finland, and they gave him arms, and they gave him money, uh, and they gave him everything he needed to foment a revolution. So Germany um, helped foment the revolution in Russia, which led to communism and the deaths of uh, hundreds of millions of people around the world. Why? Because free speech was suppressed in America, and you could not legally make a case against, like to prevent America going in the war or have it pull out after it got into the war. That's the kind of dominoes that start to happen. And given that the First World War arguably led directly to the Second World War, as, as General Fox of the French Army said, this is not peace, this is not peace, this is a armistice for 20 years, and he turned out to be right almost to the day. That is what happens when you suppress free speech, the government can go off and do what it wants, and the dominoes that fall are almost impossible to, to fathom, but almost always have incredibly disastrous results. Yeah, I always ask people why we enter World War I. Nobody has a really good answer for that. World War II, you could say, well, there was Pearl Harbor, and then Hitler declared war on us, and you were fighting Nazis. You can kind of create cause and effect. World War I, nobody has a good answer because we had no business there. And as you note, trench warfare I mean, if people want to ever make, you know, I don't want to trigger too many people. If you ever want to have a sleepless night, read about trench warfare during World War I. Read about how people were sent off to run through no man's land and their faces were shot off with machine guns because the generals, as they say, fight today's war using the methods of the last war. And they were still doing infantry style charges across the front lines, even though they were now machine gun bunkers. They were all, as you said, exhausted. They were all dug in in Europe. It would have been over. Everybody would have gone home. But the U.S., we had to intervene because, again, 
you can't sell war to the people. Think about the whole concept if you have to have a draft, right? Why in the world should you have to have a draft if it's a just war? You had to have a draft for World War I. You had to have a draft for World War II. You had to have a draft for Vietnam and Korea. Because it's very hard to make a case for war with the people, and that is why censorship is so important. It's a great Hold quote up. from Hermann Goering, right? uh, the World War I fighter ace and head of the Luftwaffe in the Second World War. He said, why, of course, the people don't want war. Why would some poor slob at a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best that he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor in America, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice. The people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. And that requires that the governments hold a significant edge. Doesn't have to be perfect, right? You can still have somewhat free speechy stuff. But when people, when there's a fuzzy edge to free speech, well, I don't know if this is going to get me in trouble or not. So I'm going to be cautious that self censorship that occurs with people when there's these fuzzy hate speech laws where nobody really knows what's going on and nothing is objectively defined and so on. That is where we need to push back against the language of those in power that drags us to the very edge of the volcano of war. And as that erodes, man, our fundamental protection is language. After that, the best you can hope for is to get home in one piece. Yeah, 100%. Their compelling case for war can't be made. The compelling case for mass immigration demographic replacement can't be replaced or can't be made. That is why they want to censor conversations on immigration in Germany. They want to censor it on social media. They're using the same kind of tactics because you can't sell people on the idea that your way of life is going to be destroyed. I mean, the great example is the Turkish president is now telling Turkish immigrants, go, I'm going to send more of you to Germany. Take it over. Repopulate. You are the future of Europe. Well, you can't have those kind of conversations in Germany, because if you did, the German people, even as brainwashed as they are, would finally realize, OK, this is an invasion. The same was true in America. There was actually a rape that happened in, I think, Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, underage girl was molested by so-called refugees. And the local prosecutor there had told the family you better not talk to the press about this anymore. You're interfering with the court case. We'll arrest you. This is all verifiable. A federal prosecutor told the family of a child rape victim, you're not allowed to talk about this because, again, the truth would get out there. And that's another example of government censorship, private censorship. So you're right. We are in a war right now, and it's a war of free speech. I'm going to keep finding it. You're going to keep finding it. we got to keep encouraging everybody listening to this to find it because the truth is on our side. And if we keep speaking, we will win. And uh, I would really encourage people, don't sit it out. Uh, a little temporary safety, a little temporary security comes at such a high price that you sure wish you hadn't played it safe uh, when the worst comes to pass, which it always does when we avoid the truth. So thanks uh, so much, Mike, for a great conversation. Just wanted to remind people, you got to check out the book, Guerrilla Mindset. It is it is necessary in times of peace. Uh, I think it is even more necessary in times of escalating intellectual and verbal and moral conflict. Guerrilla Mindset, How to Control Your Thoughts and Emotions to Live Life on Your Terms, a great audiobook. You can also get it on Amazon. MAGA Mindset, uh, we'll put a link to that below. Uh, I've read that as an audiobook. You can check it out, How to Make You in America Great Again. Check out Silenced, uh, War on Free Speech, and Follow Mike on Twitter, twitter.com slash Cernovich. Dangerandplay.com is the blog. Check that out. And uh, thanks, as always, Mike, for a great, great chat. Always a pleasure. We might actually have another chat in a week or two, depending on how something that happened works out. So we'll I, see. Uh, I, I look forward to that, too. All right. Take care, man.